here we go. So, Jim, thank you ginormously for appearing on Haymaker as host. I know how many demands you have on your time, so this is uh, just incredibly gracious of you to appear. Uh, Dave, it's great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here. Great. Now, I've listened to a number of your podcasts in recent months, and you are incredibly lucid. And I have to say, I love lucidity. Just a little tribute to Lucille Ball. You and I are old enough to remember her role. Sure. I love Lucy too. And, but you really are. And uh, let's spend some of that lucidity on your new book, uh, which is about the supply chain fiasco. It's called Sold Out. And apparently its publication has been ironically a victim of some of the supply chain constipation. That's exactly right. I had it um, pretty much done by uh, around February, March, but of course there's editing and copy editing and you always get to keep, you know, like to keep it fresh. It's one of the hardest things about writing about economics. That's why mo most well-known economists actually don't write books. Uh, a few do, but they mostly write papers because that way when they're wrong, they can just write another paper. Uh, huh. But when you, when you write a book, you're, you know, you're putting an imprint down uh, and if you want to lean forward, okay, that's, that requires some analysis and some hard work, but it, it's hard to, at some point you have to put it to bed and it takes months to actually get on the bookshelves. So then the challenge is how do you keep it fresh for the readers knowing it might not be out for a few months. And so this thing got moved from a, uh, we were targeting kind of October and then it was November 29th. And then finally, December 6th, that, that day looks right. I actually got, I just got my books. I got uh, my, in an author's contract, you have a, a cur 60 courtesy copies. They send you your own book, uh, as part of the deal. So I just got mine the other day. So the book's printed, it's in the distribution centers, but um, yeah, it's absolutely a victim of the supply chain, which is the topic of the book. Uh, I talked to my, my literary agent. She said, Jim, I represent an author. His book is done, it's printed, but they can't ship it because there's no cardboard for the boxes. Um, and uh, it's, so my, my publisher held up their end, I held up my end, but the the, the bottleneck actually is at the printers. Um, so there were printers that went, went bankrupt in, um, the pandemic uh and then they got the whole spring 2020 calendar was canceled this kind of goes back to my last book the new great depression but what happened is that books are kind of like fashion there's a spring season and a, and a fall season spring are your beach books and fall are your christmas presents um and the whole spring calendar got wiped out i was on for the fall calendar but the agents and authors in the spring calendar were screaming, I got to get my book out there. So the publishers did triage. They said, okay, these books go, these books wait. But in the fall of uh, 2020, you had all these election books and they had like a use by day. They were going to be irrelevant the day after the election, but they were trying to get them out in October. So I wasn't either. I wasn't a spring book and I wasn't an election book. So they said, well, you can wait till January 2021. And I did. It was fine. That, that book was a bestseller. But the same thing now, the supply chain bottlenecks have not gone away, but but we have a firm date of December 6th. It is, uh, it's available for pre-order right now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any any bookseller you like, uh, but it will be uh, coming out soon. The The audio book will be out the same day. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, about five years ago or so, Kindle came out and the ebook it was like with well, ebooks taking over, no more books. And the ebook, the let's say the Kindle is one format, got to about 20% of the market, but it plateaued. It just stayed there. And the rest was books. But the, the format that is surging ahead and taking up a lot more market share are the audiobooks. Um, people love the audiobooks. You can take them on planes and cars or whatever. And uh, I, I read my own. So if you can deal with my voice, uh, you're going to get me as the. Uh, um, it's like three days in the studio with headphones and a little phone, soundproof phone booth. But uh, uh, yeah, but the audio book will be available the same day. So uh, all heading for December 6th. Well, good for you on the audio book, because I went through, uh, you've got a copy of my book, Bubble 3.0, which was yep. basically about the insanity bubble that hit the crescendo last year. And we did an audio book version back and we published digitally in early, very early in the year, because we wanted to be ahead of what we thought would be the implosion of Bubble 3.0. It's kind of turned out that way, especially when it comes to the cryptos. And maybe at some point you might want to make a comment on FTX and that incredible saga. But sure. uh, I didn't have I didn't have the the guts or the probably the aptitude to do what you did. I had a professional reader record my audiobook. So congratulations on that one too. So you know, let's talk about the supply chain because it's it's a pretty hot topic right now, and it's it's different than it was a year ago. Because you know, I think it's fair to say that there is a number of uh, of improvements with some goods. For example, 
when you look at things like used cars and lumber, apparel, I mean, it looks like actually there's some deflation starting to occur with the number of, of goods and, and actually excess supplies in some cases. So any thoughts on if that's a fluke or just extremely varied? Uh, not a fluke, definitely what one would expect. It, it's a great, great question, David. It's like five parts. I'll try to unpack it a little bit, but it's a, you, know, you make a really good point. Um, so, so a couple of things have happened. So the book, the first three chapters are, are pure supply chain. Chapter one is, um, you know, it's mostly anecdotal, you know, stories of junior's cheesecake couldn't get cream cheese. They say cheesecakes are 85% cream cheese. So you couldn't get a cheesecake or a candy cane last Christmas, but uh, going on to more serious shortages, including baby formula, which really was critical and, and kids were families were suffering uh, because of that. Chapter two uh, sort of dissects that. It's okay. Why did it break down? How did it break down? Um, and why it will not come back uh, soon. It's like breaking a, a vase into 10,000 pieces. You can't glue it back together. You got to go get a new vase. Uh, and then chapter three looks at that. It looks forward. It says, what will the supply chain look in, in future? And I, I have the concept of supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019. And then there'll be a supply chain 2.0, which will come soon, but not right away, maybe four or five years. So right now we're in between, we're in a muddled, you know, kind of muddling through period between the end of supply chain 1.0 and the, uh, the, the beginning of supply chain 2.0. Now I make the point, I start this in the introduction, um, supply chains have always been around. There's nothing new about supply chains. Uh, and I talk about the uh, a Bronze Age wreck uh, discovered in a place called Ulu Barun, which is on this Mediterranean coast of Turkey. Uh, it's the oldest you know, accurately dated um, uh, uh, Bronze Age shipwreck with all, all the goods intact. And they did 10 years of underwater excavation. What they discovered... So, so you're talking the, before the birth of Christ, right? I mean, Bronze Age? Oh, yeah, 1200 BC. Wow. Yeah. It is, it's a fascinating story. I've heard you talk about that. Yeah, and and they when they went through they did like ten years of archaeology, but they found, for example, they found amber, which comes from the Baltic Sea region. They found gold, which at the time came from Sudan. They found sores, which were manufactured in present day Syria, Phoenicia at the time, but uh, present day Syria. They found the boat itself was made of Lebanese cedar. They found oil and, and olive oil um, and other foodstuffs from that, that they could identify the source. From, uh, from Italy and so forth. So this was a vessel that was doing a counterclockwise coastwise trade. You sort of European coast, you sell towards the east and the African coast, you sell towards the west. But if you if you look at the goods that were on board, it came, if you go from the Baltic Sea to Southern Sudan, not, not far from the equator, as far east as present day Iran or Persia uh, and to Spain, it's 5 million square miles. There were goods that came and the, the vessel was picking up and dropping off goods along the way, but the 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 area is 5 million square miles. So there's a supply chain for you. So that's, you know, 3,500 years ago, uh, almost 3,200 3, years ago. So there's nothing new about supply chains. What was new beginning in 1989 was supply chain science. And it's a combination of um, algorithms, applied mathematics, increased computing power, linear programming, and other techniques that could expand and extend the supply chains greater than had ever been done before. And enormous thing, and a lot of it, you know, people know about just-in-time inventory, like, hey, I, I got a car assembly line, I got to put in the seats, I want the seats to show up, like the morning that car gets to that point on the assembly line, so it's not sitting in a warehouse, not inventory, cuts costs, et cetera. Um, Walmart invented something called cross-docking. Well, what's that? Well, you know, it used to be a truck went to warehouse unloaded, and another truck pulled up and you loaded the truck and it went away. But well, Walmart said, why don't we just go from truck to truck, skip the warehouse? Uh, and that's called cross docking. Um, and then um, a Walmart store or Home Depot or Lowe's or you know others, the store is the warehouse. I mean, the reason they're so big is because they're warehouses. So it was like, okay, let's cut out the warehouse, et cetera. Um, let's go to China for cheaper labor. Let's, you know, uh, let's consolidate our number of shipping lanes. Well, all that was done and a lot more. It's all described in the book for one reason, which was to cut costs, transportation costs, labor costs, energy costs, inventory costs, financing costs, et cetera. And they did. And this helped to keep costs under control. And, you know, Walmart and Amazon were probably the greatest practitioners, but many other firms did it. 
The problem was, and I, I describe this in the book, there was a hidden cost. While they were cutting all these visible costs and reducing the end, the cost to the end consumer, there was a hidden cost, which was they were making the thing more and more frail, less resilient, less robust, et cetera, to the point where if one section broke down, the whole thing collapsed. And that's what happened. And, you know, I, I give an example, like a loaf of bread. It's like, hey, I got a loaf of bread in the store. Maybe you don't now because of, uh, because of what's going on. Well, okay, but a loaf of bread comes from a baker. Um, it needs a wrapper that's going to, either going to be plastic or paper. It had to get there by a truck. The trucker had to take the bread from the baker to the distribution center or the store. Uh, the truck needs diesel. You need a truck driver. Someone's got to make the truck. Let's go over to the baker baked in an oven, where'd the oven come from? You know, where did the manufacturer get the tempered glass and steel to build the oven? Uh, and you need energy to run the oven. And by the way, where did the baker get the flour? Got it from a mill. Where did the mill get it? They got it from a farmer who grew the wheat. That also had to be transported by train or truck from the farm to the mill. And then the, tr the farmer needs a tractor and diesel and harvesters. And oh, and by the way, nitrogen fertilizer, which comes from Russia, et cetera. So the point being, every there's there's an immense supply chain in a loaf of bread when you go through you know wrapper baker ingredients wheat farmer transportation et cetera, et cetera. and every link in that supply chain has its own supply chains of um you know where truckers where trucking firms get the truck drivers etc and 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 on and on and on so i came to the conclusion i say this in the book that the supply chain is not part of the economy the supply chain is the economy. It's there's nothing you can think of that doesn't have a supply chain behind it. Now that's true, and then you stretch these things uh, immensely to cut costs. You've created an enormous fragility, and, and give you a real concrete example. So um, you know Germany's a major car manufacturer. You got Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, and BMW, and others. Um, there's uh, several hundred miles of wire in a car, you know, with all the controls and uh, hydraulics and electronics, et cetera. And uh, you can't just like throw the wires all over the car. There are conduits, there are plastic conduits that they install and then they run the wires through it to wherever they need to go. Those conduits are made by a firm in Ukraine. Well, Ukraine's got a few problems right now, including war, and they can't get them. So BMW and Volkswagen had to shut down assembly lines for for sophisticated automobiles not because they couldn't get chassis or, or leather seats because they couldn't get this plastic part because you got to put that on first so you run all the wires through it so okay so the war in ukraine is a big subject in and of itself but for the lack of a, a plastic part a conduit you had to shut down major automobile assembly lines in germany i i could give 100 examples today but but the point is um you, you see the point which is that the, in the in the name of efficiency and lowering costs, we've created enormous fragility, and now it's all breaking down, and it's going to be a, a big job, five to ten year job, to put it back together. So basically, it was the supply chain was over optimized, and that led to all that fragility. We basically went from just in time inventories you described to just in case. Right. That, that's, that's right. That's going to be with us for a while. These, yeah, and, these... and we used to have, uh, and, and, there, then, and then it kind of feeds on itself. It's like what happens when systems like this broke down. So, for example, breakdown. So, for example, I like a particular brand of salsa, I like hot sauce, you know. So I go to the supermarket. This, this is a real story. This happened. I go to the supermarket, and there's none on the shelf. They, they don't have it. I go back the second time. They don't have it. I go back the third time. They got in a case. It was like a whole case. But I usually buy two jars. Well, now I buy... 10 jars because I'm like, well, I don't know what's going to happen the next time. Maybe they won't have it. That's an inventory management. That's called safety stock. You buy some extra inventory. So I pay for that out of my pocket, but it's on the shelf behind me here. But the point is I'm financing safety stock in my own house because I can't rely on the store to have it in the back room. Well, what does that do to the next person who wants hot sauce? They don't get any because I took it all. And same thing happens to me and some other product. And everyone's doing the same thing. So you can call it hoarding. You can criticize it. It is inefficient uh, and it costs money. But that's how people react to real supply chain shortages, which, of course, only makes it worse because now, you know, who knows when the next shipment of hot sauce is coming in. Take that and multiply by all the products in a supermarket, 20 aisles, you know, 10,000 products. I actually used to work in a supermarket, so, I, I, you know, you stock shelves up and down the aisles. Uh, but, Wait, but and you drove a truck and you drove a forklift, right? I drove a forklift. I drove a many, many talents. 
I drove a taxi. My most, uh, the one job I, I said, this is probably not the future. I, I picked strawberries on a farm. And for those who don't know, strawberry plants are very short. They're about this high. And the farmer only paid me if they were ripe. So you got to get down on your knees in the dirt, pick them by hand, look for the ripe ones. Like I think I got 25 cents a pint or something like that. I didn't do that long, but it was, you know, at least I, I did it. So yeah, I've had a lot of real world jobs. So when I talk about the economics of it, in many cases, I understand exactly uh, what it's all about. Well, you're a very rare economist in terms of real world experience and also the accuracy of your forecast. But you use the term, uh, it's much less efficient with this kind of what you call safety stockpiling. Yeah. So what, what are the implications of that for productivity, which is already not great? Well, this is where, uh, it's a great question. This is where we get into supply chain 2.0. So I talked to a guy who, you know, uh, again, supply chain has been around forever. What was new was the science of supply chain management. It's now a, it's an academic major. You can go to a major research university and major in supply chain science, and, and a lot of people do. But I talked to the guy who probably this, the, the, the individual who, the single most responsible individual for the creation of the modern supply chain. Um, he was CEO of a major technology company. He said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. It took three years to blow it up. It's not coming back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years or longer to create the new supply chain. And that's what, uh, as I mentioned, chapter three is about. So what I describe um, is what I call a, a college of nations. Um, and others have different names. Johnny Ellen has referred to it as friendshoring. Uh, Emmanuel Macron refers to it as a constellation of nations. But the idea is we're still going to have a supply chain. We always will. But it'll be like a club. And to get in this club, you're going to have to be a you know a democratic, liberal society. I don't mean the politics. I just mean those in the in the political science sense or the political philosophy sense, not you know left versus right. But it would be, for example, uh, you know, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Western Europe, UK, um, probably India, you know, and other other countries around the world, probably Brazil. But there'll be countries with shared value, good rule of law, uh, you know, good concern for humanitarian issues, et cetera, who will trade with each other. But it won't include China. Uh, Russia will be, you know, maybe they're in the penalty box, but, but China will definitely not be in it. China will have to construct its own club, whatever you want to call it, uh, that would include, you know, resource suppliers in Africa and maybe outsourcing in South Asia. And there'll be some people who kind of play both sides and that's fine. But people say the U.S. is decoupling from China, which is true, but China is decoupling from the U.S. This is a, a, a second nasty divorce, but both sides want out. Um, and or the roses. Well, th that's right. Uh, so, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, you know, relative to some base costs, will be higher uh, because you'll, the, you know, the Chinese have a lot. Uh, a lot they do is repugnant, but they do. They are, you know, they are the manufacturing hub of the world. That's true. Uh, be more expensive to do it without them, but it'll be worth it. And, and the way I look at it, the Delta, you know, the extra costs that we might pay at the store. That's like buying insurance. You know, you buy insurance on your house. You don't want anything bad to happen. Uh, but when you write the check to the insurance company, you don't think you're wasting your money. You think you're that's money well spent. And heaven forbid, if something does happen, you're covered. Well, it'll be the same thing in supply chain 2.0. Things might be a little more expensive, but will be much more resilient, much more robust. And again, Deb, I can give you concrete examples because I can I can tell you the theory all day long. But 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 I think the examples are much more meaningful. So Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, biggest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturer in the world, based in Taiwan, obviously. Um, they Warren just Buffett now... agrees with you, Jim. Sorry? Warren, Buffett agrees. Warren Buffett agrees with you, Jim. He just, I think he bought $4 billion worth of stock in it here recently. Well, good good move. Uh, he's using up some of that $130 billion of cash he stashed away. But, um, but uh, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, they've just announced two $10 billion plus fabrication plants that they're building in Arizona. And there's a whole Arizona thing with, you know, got solar power and a lot of good transportation hub, et cetera. And Intel is doing the same thing. I believe in Oregon or Washington, might, might be Oregon, uh, a new fab plant. So there's $30 billion plus going into new fabs, uh, semiconductor fabrication plants, brand new, state of the art. It's going to take three to five years to build in Oregon and Arizona. 
well, why aren't they building it in Taiwan? Well, because Taiwan's in the crosshairs of China. And there's something called the, uh, the US military is a doctrine, they call it the broken nest theory. And it actually comes from a Chinese proverb, but, but just, just to kind of cut to the chase, if China invades Taiwan, either the Taiwanese or the US or both are going to burn Taiwan Semiconductor to the ground. They're going to destroy it because they don't want it to fall into the hands of the Chinese communists. Taiwan knows that. It's like, okay, we're we are one step ahead of the Shushan. We're going to build new plants in the US. But this is a concrete, this is real money, $30 billion. But this is a concrete example of what I'm talking about, where we're still going to have semiconductor supply chains. They're, they're going to have to get silicon and um, other you know, components uh, from somewhere. But it'll be this club, what I call the College of Nations. We're going to cut our ties to China. We already are. Um, and, and again, many, uh, many, many examples of this. So it won't be everything in the United States. It won't be our autarky, nor should it. But it will be sourcing in Australia and, and Japan and Germany, not not China and not um, you know their their allies. Well, we're going to get to China in a bit because I know that's a hot topic for you. But before that, obviously, the pandemic amplified the seizing up of the supply chain. Just no question about it. Right. From listening to you in various podcasts, it sounds like you believe most countries poorly manage their COVID response. If you were emperor of the world, how would you have reacted? Perhaps more like what they did in Sweden and Norway. Sure, and th now we now we have the data between now and 2020. We have the data. We can see what worked and what didn't. But I, I said so at the time. I said a lot of others, by the way. It wasn't it wasn't just me. I mean, what's interesting is uh, so my book on the pandemic is called The New Great Depression. Came out in January 2021. I wrote most of it. Oh, thank there you. It <laughs> there it is. That's it. Um, I wrote most of it really in the spring of uh, 2020. And as I mentioned, we were trying to get out in the fall of 2021, got pushed back a few months, but that's okay. It, it was still timely. And I said in the book, masks don't work. Lockdowns don't work. I said there would be no vaccines. And I was right. Everyone's like, got a vaccine. Sorry, they're, they're not vaccines. These, these are experimental gene modification therapies get it if you want. Um, I've completely avoided it. But my point being, they're not traditional vaccines. I don't care what, uh, what's the guy, Jared Kushner, I don't care what he calls them. They're, they're not vaccines. They don't do two things. They don't stop infection and they don't stop the spread. Well, if you don't do those two things, you're not a vaccine, you're something. We'll, we'll find out the hard way what it actually is. But here's my point. I said all those things and so did others. But the evidence was there in the spring of 2020. For example, I said lockdowns don't work. That was based on a paper in 2006 in reaction to the swine flu uh, at the time written by D.A. Henderson. Now, who's D.A. Henderson? D.A. Henderson is probably the greatest immunologist, epidemiologist in history. He's the individual credited with the eradication of smallpox on the planet Earth. Now, of course, that was a thousands of people and institutions and multi-decade. Yeah, it was a big lift. But he was the guy who was given credit for it. He won the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor in the United States, equivalent to the Congressional Medal of Honor, dean of the um, Johns Hopkins School of Public, Bloomberg School of Public Health. So basically, you can go no higher in epidemiology than D.A. Henderson. And he wrote a paper in 2006, and he said, uh, he said lockdowns don't work. And he explained why. Uh, he said, if you're a small island, and there's only one way in or out, and you block it, Okay, maybe, but that's not the world. I mean, we got airplanes and trains and cars and 8 billion people and lots of interaction. And even if you impose lockdown, lockdowns were the worst possible thing. The best thing you could have done in the pandemic was go outside with no mask and get some fresh air and sunshine and take some um, vitamin D and, and a few other things. And it doesn't that doesn't mean you weren't going to get it, but that was like the healthiest thing you could do. Um, when you put... When you lock people in homes, it's it's like an incubator because somebody comes in, you know, it could be a, a relative or mother, mother, mother or father, sister, brother, or cleaning person or whatever. You're creating these little, with the windows closed, you're creating these incubators. And this accounts for the nursing home deaths, you know, et cetera. So um, not to mention destroying society, destroying social interaction. Um, alcoholism is up. Drug abuse is up. Suicide is up. Uh, social uh, interaction is down, uh, et cetera. And so, uh, and we put people like Fauci in charge. I call him, he's the new, uh, he's a Mengele for the 21st century. I mean, how many people did he kill? You know, an accredited doctor, how many people did he kill with uh, really bad medical advice? All part of a cover up because he was funding 
the creation of the virus in the lab in Wuhan. And that's another thing I said. I said, this came from a lab in Wuhan. I was very balanced. I looked at the wet market theory. I said, why would China ban international inspection teams from going into the wet market if that's where it came from? Wouldn't you want them in there to prove it did? Well, the answer is it's not where it came from. Uh, it came from the lab. All it's, only, it's only BSL-4 lab in, in the country, right? Yeah, and uh, well- That's it, pretty coincidental. You, 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 would, you would hope so, but it actually wasn't. It was level three, it wasn't level four. And, uh, and the point is, uh, but the money came from Fauci and from uh, Peter Danzig and, and a few others. And they started the research at the University of North Carolina and they had to outsource it, speaking of supply chain, because it was deemed illegal to do that in the United States. So how are you any further ahead funding it in China through cutouts and middlemen? Well, but my point, my, my point, Dave, is that the the virus came from uh, the lab in Wuhan. Masks don't work. Lockdowns don't work. The vaccines aren't vaccines. I said all that in, in 2020 based on evidence. I mean, it wasn't guesswork. So then in 20, early 2022, people are saying, you know, well, the latest research shows that masks don't work. It's like, duh. Yeah, that was that was well known. There's no there's no re, there's no research. Even if he, what about surgeons in a surgical room? They've shown empirically that surgical surgery rooms are safe because they're highly germ free. They're like everything's sterilized and they're closed. That's why and it's not the dopey mask that the doctor wears. It's the fact that you're in a sterilized environment. So my point being, the public policy response was worse than uh, ignorant, worse than incompetent. It had a purpose. Inside every government bureaucrat is an inner fascist waiting to come out. And uh, they were all empowered by COVID. Now you get into politics. Um, yeah, the Democrats are like, hey, let's change all the voting rules while we're at it. You know, as Rahm Emanuel said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, we're still living with that. Um, and uh, so uh, what it really dest it destroyed a lot of things. It destroyed trust, but it really destroyed confidence in experts. And now here we are in the supply chain crisis, still going strong in 2022. And you've got these economists giving uh, recommendations, but nobody wants to listen to them, nor should you, because they actually don't know what they're doing. Well, speaking of epidemiologists, that's why I brought up the example of Norway. I believe, and you can correct me on this, but uh, I believe the, the uh, person that led the COVID response in Norway was the only OECD country that was actually an epidemiologist. And of course, he had tremendous criticism, especially in the Western mainstream media, for his points of view, which were very similar to what you just articulated. Right. But the time has pretty much vindicated him. That's right. And by the way, this is still going on, and it is a contributor to the supply chain breakdown. I want to come back to that because you made the point that COVID and the pandemic panic and the bad public policy made the supply chain worse, which it did. But it wasn't the start of it. Uh, and I'll come back to that, what actually was the start. But in terms of what's going on now, look at China's zero COVID policy. Now, that makes no sense. Uh, it's a top-down Communist Party directive. You know, one person tests positive. They put you in isolation. Three people test positive. They shut a whole neighborhood. A hundred people test positive. They shut down cities. Shanghai, 26 million people locked down last spring. Beijing, 22 million people locked down last spring and so forth. And of course, this is destroying China's economy there. They lie about their numbers, but to, to the extent we can see through that and get independent sources, it looks like China's in actually growth is going to drop. It's actually a recession right now from a, an economy that went 30 years at 10% annual compounded. They're, they're actually shrinking. Um, well, okay. So that's, that's ridiculous, uh, destructive public policy. But why are they in that situation? How is it the case that the U.S. got out of it with a lot of bad policy, but we're, it's kind of behind us? Europe, same thing, bad choices, but kind of behind us. And it's not behind in China. The answer is herd immunity. And I've said many times, the cure for COVID is COVID. If you get COVID, first of all, the, the mortality rate is a fraction of 1%. And, and you know, every death is a tragedy. But it's about two-tenths of 1%, which is no more than... A normal seasonal flu. The other 99.8% um, get through it just fine. You know, some cases worse than others, some inconvenience, but you get through it. But the natural antibodies that you develop from having COVID are the best immunization against getting COVID again. You can get it twice. Again, I recognize that. 
but that's a stronger natural response than these phony vaccines. And we got through that and we're at that point. China never did it because they never uh, they never use Western um, so-called vaccines. Their own vaccines are highly deficient. They do have an aging population and they were never willing to kind of like take the, the pain and get through it. So they, they've got a population that by and large has not had COVID and they don't have any real treatment protocols. And so they keep locking down and locking down. Well, that gives that buys you a little short-term relief, but there's at an enormous immediate cost in terms of economics and the greater long-term epidemiological cost in the sense that your population never gets to so-called herd immunity. Uh, and so it's never going to end if they keep doing it. So this is a major, uh, it, it's a, again, public policy and health policy failure, but it's an even bigger impediment to getting the supply chain going again, and, and it won't. So you said it's never going to work. I was, I was going to ask you about China's reaction to the, the COVID and COVID variants and so forth. And so will they persist? It sounds like your answer to this is yes. And they're a futile, at least to me, I think it's futile attempt to, to, to try to have zero COVID. I mean, it seems to me that's just an impossible dream. Well, it is medically and epidemiologically and economically, although they, you know, the, the China's at a point, look, we're back to Mao. I mean, Xi Jinping is the new Mao Zedong. Uh, we all remember the Great Famine in the 1950s, the Great Leap Forward, uh, you know, 20, 30 50 million people died of starvation. We don't know how many, but that's the right order of magnitude. Uh, but that's Xi's a, a, a communist through and through, and he's willing to sacrifice growth to do this. But, but the question is, um, where will it end? Since it's it's medically mission impossible, you you won't get there. You got to just let it spread. Um, the answer is when you get into something like a new Tiananmen Square on a national basis, and that's starting. I mean, there was a riot uh, in, I believe, Guangzhou province, but um, regardless of the exact location, a few days ago, where people just said, that's it. You know, they got you got COVID testing centers every two blocks. You got concentration, COVID concentration camps where you're put for quarantine. You're locked in your apartments. There have been cases where the police came and they they locked people in their apartments by putting up like bolting, putting bolts on the outside of the door. So you couldn't even get out of the apartment. Suicides are right. Anyway, one crowd was fed up and they just knocked down, they just rioted. They knocked down all the COVID tents. They knocked down all the barricades. That's human nature. It doesn't matter if you live in China or, you know, US or, 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 you know, look at the, the yellow vest, the, uh, the, the, the riots that went on in France. And uh, you're going to, by the way, you're going to see this in Germany in the coming months. Um, there are things going on there. You know, everyone's like, German reserves are 100%, highest natural gas reserves ever. Well, yeah, that's true. What they don't tell you is that the reserves are only 20% of what they need. So what you have is 100% of 20%. You're not going to make it through the winter. Um, and when they start rationing it, and now they're talking about rationing money, as you put it in Reuters uh, the other day, where they might say, well, we're going to not let you use your ATM. We're only going to give you enough money uh, or control the flow of money so you can buy uh, oil, natural gas, or coal, or home heating fuel, or or food, but you can't spend it on a vacation or, you know, gold or getting out of the country. Um, this is this gets into a whole other thing with central bank digital currencies, but they're not even at that stage, but they are at the stage of rationing money because they're going to have to ration fuel and of course, the eggheads, the bureaucrats always say, well, here's my plan. You know, we're only going to let you have a certain amount of money and et cetera. But they never, they lack common sense. They may have a lot of IQ points, but they're not that smart and they lack common sense. And they don't think about the reaction function. You know, somebody, you know, they talk about 3D chess and 4D chess, whatever. Chess is 2D. I mean, it just is. The, the challenge in chess it's not that it's 3D or 4D, it's that it's in 2D, but can you think three moves ahead? That's the hard part. And I'm friends with Gary Kasparov has spoken to him about this. It's really, really difficult. These bureaucrats can't even think one move ahead. Uh, you know, Gary's three, maybe four on a good day, but they can't think one move ahead. They, 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 the reaction function is going to be riots and demonstrations and property destruction and breakdown once you tell people that we're freezing your money and the ATMs are closed, the banks are closed because. Um, so that that's uh, that's coming. I agree with you. I think it's part of what I've been calling the great pushback where people, you know, initially there was a lot of trust in governments and, you know, maybe going back a few years, but 
certainly what happened in COVID undercut a lot of that trust. And I think people are getting really fed up. I think you're seeing that even in Iran. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of people are paying for that with their lives as they brutally crack down something that they're no to do. But let's get back to China, because I think you're fair to say that you're actually quite bearish on China right now. I mean, you believe it's on the brink of a historic collapse. I think that qualifies as fairly bearish. Yeah. Uh, and the, first of all, that's, that's absolutely right. That's my view. There, there are a number, you know, there's, there's this whole myth of uh, China, you know, they're overtaking the U.S. and GDP. I never thought that would happen. I still don't. Um, they're they're going to be on the cutting edge of technology, AI, quantum computing, et cetera. Their military is growing faster than ours, et cetera. It's all, it's all not true. I mean, it, it's, yeah, okay, they've made technological advances, you know, give them credit. They are building up the military. But I mean, they, they've got one aircraft carrier and they it doesn't go anywhere. It sails around for show. Uh, they're still training pilots to land on the things. Um, but uh, but China has much worse problems and much more better problems. So we all know about the real estate collapse and the communist leadership keeps saying, well, throw them a little stimulus or uh, give people some, you know, make force the banks to give the developers some loans to finish the homes. So they have a different mortgage system in China. They are, you borrow the money and you sign the mortgage note, but there's no house. The developer takes the money and builds the house and delivers it to you, and then you move in. But you've already signed the note. What happened was, it's kind of like um, FTX. You know, the developers were taking the money and using it, either stealing it or using it to prop up other enterprises and not delivering the homes, particularly when real estate values started to collapse. And, and by the way, the supply chain shortages kicked in. So there were kind of many riots and protests over that. Uh, so they're like, we'll call the bank. Well, okay, now lend the developers some money so they can finish the homes so we don't have a riot from mortgagors who didn't get their homes. That only gets you so far. It doesn't prop up prices. It doesn't make people want to go out and buy another house when they've already been defrauded on the first one. Um, and how are you going to pay back the loan? Because these these developers are already insolvent. So that's these are Band-Aids, uh, so to speak, but, uh, but that's not going to work. But that's only one of their problems. 50% of the water in China is, is like laced with cyanide. I mean, you, undrinkable, unusable, even as, you know, recycled wastewater. Um, the, the, the demographic implosion, it, there's nothing like it. You can look at the Black Death as a model, you know, approximately 30% of the population of Europe dying out in a two to three year period. Uh, it was very good for workers, by the way, because returns to labor went up and returns to capital went down for 75 years after the Black Death because there was a shortage of labor. You actually had to pay people to work. So that's the closest example we have, but doesn't quite capture what's going on in China. They may lose 600 million people in the next 50 years. Between now and 2075, uh, their population may go from 1.4 billion to uh, perhaps uh, 800 million or even less. Um, you know, there are fancy equations and descriptions of GDP, uh, and you can get as complicated as you want, but there's a simple two-part definition, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Labor force times productivity, that equals nominal GDP. Well, if your labor force is imploding by 600 million and your productivity is going down for other reasons, that that's an economy that's on the brink of collapse. Now, it doesn't mean they're not dangerous. And um, Hal Brands and Michael Becky, two scholars, one from Johns Hopkins, Sice, where I went to school, and one from Tufts, uh, have come up with this thesis. They call it peak China. And, I ch and so the question is, will China invade Taiwan? Will China engage in more provocative acts in the South China Sea, et cetera, um, similar to the turning points that uh, the the uh, German Empire and Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II had to confront in 1914, and the Japanese, um, you know, Tojo and the military in Japan in 1941. And the answer is, you may not be as strong as the guy you're confronting, but it might be as good as it gets. In other words, if if you're still on the up, if you're on the uptrend, you're gaining strength. Why would you start a war? You wouldn't, you'd wait. Like, hey, why don't I get a little stronger, even stronger if it's if things are going my way? But if you think you're you've peaked and your opponent is getting stronger, the conclusion is even though I'm relatively weaker, I might as well attack now because my 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 this is as good as it gets. And so um Japan launched World War II with the well in the Pacific with the attack of Pearl Harbor, and uh Germany launched World War One in league with Austria. 
um, and other allies, um, uh, you know, as the situation escalated in 1914. But but the point being, the German Navy wasn't as strong as the Royal Navy never was, but it was as strong as it was going to get, uh, at least in the short run on a relative basis. So China may be extremely dangerous, um, but it doesn't mean they're, if things continue, they're taking over the world. They've got environmental, demographic, financial governance and other uh, I wouldn't call them headwinds. I would say uh, policies that are almost designed to cause the country to collapse. So uh, I guess you can say I'm not bullish on China. Well, and it's the old saying that China is getting old before it gets rich. And you know, you're talking about their demographic decline, and then you look at India, which is becoming kind of an arch rival for them. And they're going the other way. Correct. And it was not that long ago that India had a population of a billion people, and and China was 1.4 billion, and Right. I believe that is uh, India's population is now slightly larger than, and the trends are you know, going the opposite direction. Correct. But your point, about the demo, your point about the demographics is a big one in terms of productivity because um, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's are all highly correlated with age. So not only is China- Careful. <laughs> well, I'm there. Like I got it's six just, grandkids. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a fact that, you know, take your antioxidants uh, and get some, get some exercise. But- um, um it's just a fact and all three of those diseases are progressive meaning they get worse and they're not curable so as not only is the population declining but when you look at the age cohorts the older population is increasing so you have a declining overall population with an increasing cohort of people who are going to be in their 70s 80s and 90s and by the way same thing in in japan same thing elsewhere around the world we don't have to pick on china so so now your cohort of say 25 to 54 prime working age is shrinking as a percentage of the whole because the population is aging. Um, but more and more of those workers, again, between 25 and 54, have to be involved in, um, in home care, basically taking care of the older people. And that is a very worthy occupation, but it does not lend itself to productivity gains. Taking a bath hasn't changed in 5,000 years. Okay, 1870... 1870, we got indoor plumbing, hot water, great. That's a big deal. But that was the last you know, technological improvement in bathing. Uh, and uh, so if, if the older population is, is increasing as a percentage, which it is, and more and more of the working age population have to take care of the older population, which they do. Robots don't do baths. It's got to be a caretaker, uh, caregiver. Um, then your your available uh, prime working age population is shrinking even more. So again, this is another indicator of uh, coming economic collapse. I mean, well, Peter, what, Peter Zion's made some similar comments about Russia and its its population shrinkage and its its weakening strength, and that that's one reason why they've had. And he was saying this even before the invasion of Ukraine that that's why they would likely do something that's kind of an act of desperation. Yeah, Peter Peter's a really smart guy. I know him pretty well. I, I he likes to pick on Russia. I uh I would I would make one distinction between Russia and China. And, and he's right, the, the same demographics are true in Russia. That's absolutely correct. Last time I was in Moscow and you drive from the airport to uh to downtown, there are these big uh, billboards. And I was there in Russia and I was traveling with my translator. Uh, but I said, What do they say? He said, basically Putin's telling people to get to work and have more kids. Uh, so, so that was uh, instead of you know Coca-Cola or beer, it was like, you know, get to work, people. Um, but Russia has uh enormous strategic depth and enormous natural resources, and China does not. So uh and I had a I had this conversation with uh Saki Kibarasan. Uh he was the assistant finance minister in the 80s. He was very famous, he's known as Mr. Yen at the time. But uh, we were in Korea having lunch, and uh I said, you know, and I was talking about Japan, I said Saki Barasan, I mean, you know. Um, you have these demographic trends, uh, your debts, debt to GDP ratio is your triple. Anyone else, your population is declining. You've been in basically a depression for 30 years, you know, three lost decades. I said, how does that work out? I mean, by the way, if you go to Ginza, the lights are on and the town, you know, town's wide open. And he said, he said, what you're missing is that our overall growth rate is declining or in recession, but our per capita numbers are much stronger because our population is shrinking. And of course he's right. And I, I said, yeah, uh, yeah, got it. Uh, I, but I, I, I raised the ante. I said, so the end game is there's one person left in Japan and they own the whole country. Uh, I don't think he thought that was humorous, but, it, but it makes the point. 
Yeah, okay, <laughs> so did I. Uh, but but it makes the point, uh, Japanese sense humor is a little different, but it makes the point that um, you have to think of, you do have to think of things on a per capita basis, not just on a gross basis. And you have to factor in efficiency and natural resources. But, but China doesn't have either one. And, and Russia does in, in one way and Japan does in another way. Japan never, or sorry, China never got out of the middle income trap. And, you know, when I studied economics in that, well, I studied all along, but, but development economics in particular in graduate school, we we thought at the time, and this was like, you know, Walt Rostow and others, that that the hard part was going from poor to middle. That was really hard. And you had the takeoff theory and, and a lot else. But once you got to middle, you were kind of on your way to high income. Turns out that's not true. Uh, poor to middle is actually very straightforward. You just move people from farms to cities. You get Lego style manufacturing jobs. You combine that with foreign capital. It's not high tech, but it is high productivity, crank it out, run a trade surplus and reinvest and you're on your way. Poor to middle is easy. Turns out that what's hard is going from middle to high, going from 10,000 per year per capita income to 20,000, which is regarded as high income. You know, US is like 75,000 or whatever. Um, that's hard because it's not the, the world to urban Lego manufacturing model doesn't work. You need value added technology. You need high tech. And that's why China has been stealing it, but they've shown very little capacity to create it. Germany can, Japan can, US can, and others. China has not shown that ability. So they're stuck at a time when everything else is going against them. Uh, so um, not, uh, there's, you know, Japan can muddle through, Germany can muddle through, although they have a lot of difficulties this winter, but China has no way out. Well, on that topic, uh, getting back to Japan, because you're making an important point about shrinking population with relatively flat GDP. And so I think you're saying the growth rate on a GDP or per capita basis was actually going up a little bit. The other thing they have going for them is, of course, they owe, uh, I mean, their government is extremely indebted, much more than the United States is, but it's to themselves. And they also have an immense international investment position on a net basis. In other words, they own way more than they owe. That right. used to be true the United States. It no longer is. We are right. now, I think it's we're in a $17 trillion deficit position. I think it's close to 80% of GDP on that basis. Yep. So let, let's spin the globe and talk a little bit about the U.S. because I will say that I'm very concerned about a funding crisis for the U.S. government next year based on, I think, our common, well, I know our common belief that we're going to have a recession. And we know what happens to deficits and recessions. They go up drastically. And then we've got QT going on, which I think gets not nearly enough press. Everybody's focused on the interest rate increases. Talk about those a little bit. But then you've got the U.S. banks that are stuffed like foie gras geese with uh, treasuries. I mean, they are stuffed to the gills. And I mean, how do you feel that's going to work out next year when the government's got to raise incremental trillions of dollars? Yeah, that'll work out fine. That's not, that's not a problem. And here's why. Um, everyone says, you know, banks are stuffed to the gills with treasury notes. They're not. They're, it's about 15% of the balance sheet. But in the, if you go back to the 1950s, 1960s, treasury obligations were 50% of bank balance sheets. They were much more conservative. And if, you know, now foreigners, there, there may be other problems. I think there will be. Foreign investors may lose their appetite for U.S. government securities. But then one phone call from Jay Powell to Jamie Dimon, as they shoot them in. The, in words, the U.S. banks are captive of the U.S. government. They'll do what they're told. And if they're told to buy treasury notes, they will. Now, that may mean less money for other, you know, other types of lending and other types of money creation. At the end crowding of the day... Out. It's a crowding out scenario. Yeah, sorry? That's a crowding out scenario? Crowding out? Um, yeah, at, at some level. Uh, but um, unless you want to increase leverage, which is reduce capital requirements, which is a separate game. But the, the, the U.S. bank, the big U.S. banks will buy all the treasuries they're told to buy. And if failing that, and I, I don't think it will fail, but if it does, the Fed will buy them. Now, so we always, the Fed is not just a lender of last resort, they're a buyer of last resort. And we can print the money. So so we'll, we'll never have a problem selling U.S. government debt because somebody, either banks or the Fed itself, will be forced to buy them. Debt's issued by the treasury. Um, but here's the problem. The problem would be, to what to what extent does that result in inflation? That's a problem. And what happens to the foreign exchange rate? And this is where modern monetary theorists, modern monetary theorists go with the first part, which is you can print all the money you want. Well, that's actually true, but they don't understand foreign exchange channels and they don't understand inflation deflation channels. That's what that was. That's 
they treat the U.S. as a closed um, system. And it's quite the, it's the opposite of a closed system. It's completely sure. internationalized. So you have to look at the role of the euro banks. You have to look at exchange rates. You have to look at interest rates and inflation. That's where the stress comes in. Not that we can't sell the debt, but the question is at what at what yield. Um, so so I, I'm not saying all is well in the U.S. government debt world. It, it's not, but we're not going to have any problem selling the debt. The question is, can you sustain the dollar itself? That's that's the, that's the real problem. Uh, so, Dave, I'll, uh, it's been great uh, being with you. Probably have to, uh, uh, you know, kind of wrap up. But uh, I hope we uh, sounds like we should do another uh, another interview one of these days because there's a, there's a lot on the table. But I do. Uh, uh, but my book has sold out. In addition to uh, uh, three chapters on the supply chain, has a chapter on inflation, kind of what we were just talking about, but it also has a chapter on disinflation and deflation. And people are not ready for that. And I see that that's coming right right behind the inflation. This disinflation is going to come very quickly, a lot more quickly than people expect. Um, and part of the reason is that the inflation came from the supply side, not the demand side. Demand side inflation, so-called demand pull, that can feed on itself. That's what we had in the, last, in the late 70s. That can get out of control. And that's why Paul Volcker put interest rates at 20%. But supply side inflation... Uh, energy shortages, you know, supply chain kind of things we've been talking about is self-negating. You know, the old saying, uh, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because people, uh, if people buy the gasoline at a double the price because demand is inelastic, there's, okay, they may, but there's that much left, o- left over for everything else. You're cutting out, dinner's out, new suit, new dress, uh, you know, vacation. You're cutting out all the other stuff to fill your tank and that's where you cause a general recession and then the prices actually come down now that's a hard message for people to hear in a world where inflation's in your face but that's coming next and i explain it in the book and i think it will help investors get ready for the next shock so if you have time because that is one of the questions i was going to ask you is because that's a fairly uh non-consensus i just say it's a highly non-consensus view is right now we have tremendous focus on inflation for good reason. I think you believe the Fed's going to over tighten, and especially with QT. Yeah. But I mean, will so to give you some support on your viewpoint, uh, the, the Google searches for deflation are basically double what they were even during the Great Recession, global financial crisis. So obviously, people are starting to get worried about that. So how do you see it transitioning from this relatively, you know, very high 1970s type of inflation to perhaps a deflationary scenario. How does how do we get from here to there? Very abruptly. Uh, the way the well, short answer is recession and a, and a bad one. Uh, and then the prices come down fast and all the people who were geared up for just from an investor's point of view, you know, this could be a great time to buy 10 year treasury notes uh, because, um, you know, the ra- rates went up. Yeah, they've got over 4%. That was the inflationary vector, but that's not sustainable. And they, they could come down to, you know, 2% before you know it. And there's some huge capital gains there. So uh, I would, the short answer is... Uh, the, uh, the deflation is coming sooner than people expect. So bad recession, but doesn't that also imply a really nasty stock market? Much yep. worse of a decline than we've seen so far? Sure. I, we're just getting started. Okay. Well, I don't want to delay you any longer. Jim, you've been great. Uh, and what, can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit more about how they can access you? Do you have different tiers, retail tier, institutional tier? How can people avail themselves of your wit and wisdom? Well, uh, if they uh, a lot of what we talked about in much more expanded form and forward-looking. Uh, my book sold out, available uh, right now on uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Pals and any other website you like. And I have a newsletter called Strategic Intelligence. If you just Google Jim Ricker Strategic Intelligence, you'll find the landing page. Um, got a, a it's one of the I think highest paid that was our highest circulation paid financial newsletters out there. Um, and very active on Twitter at James G. Rickards, R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S, one word, at James G. Rickards. But uh, yeah, th- thanks, Dave. Thanks for the opportunity. Hope we can uh, do this again. All right. Sounds great. Thanks again, Jim. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving to you. You too.